let's get going. So, Mike Biddle, hello. Hello, how are hello. you? Good, how are you? Not too bad, not too bad. I'm, uh, I've had a long day. I've been working very hard all day, and I'm now relaxing to call a friend and drink a lovely can of cider. It's good. Wow, cider. I, I, don't, I don't drink. You don't partake, but I, but I will on your behalf. Yeah, I, I should grab myself before we really get going. You should grab like a cup, cup of coffee or something. A cup Coke. Of tea. Coke. A Coke, Coke, of course. Where's Coca-Cola? It's in the fridge. Oh, my God. I... <laughs> I, I, I'm one of those people that prepares nothing and then just ends up randomly calling Mike Bithell. Yeah, you were you were like the most obvious person to try this out with because A, you talk a lot. I do, I do. And then B, you were online. And That's true. C, you That's were true. part of the Twitter conversation that inspired this. Yes. About the whole, uh, the whole controversy about uh, JonTron yesterday. <clears throat> yeah, which I've not been following the whole thing, to be honest. I kind of, I came in when uh, when Laura put up the, uh, the chat chat with uh, Total Biscuit. I, I, I'm really enjoying the first comments in the chat right now. Might want to make yourself louder or mic quieter. That that sums up pretty much everything. Yeah, about, right? that's, <laughs> that's our relationship summarized. This is this is a good this is a good good start of this conversation. Is, do you want to do that on your end, or do you want me to? I, uh... I, I just did it on my end. Let's see if okay. this is better. Um, so, yeah, no, that the thing yesterday was kind of a. I think uh, the the um, the thing that went live like an hour ago, uh, the conversation between um, uh, Total Biscuit and uh, Laura. I think was uh really really good. Mhm. Mm um I think that that addressed a lot of the thing. I mean it's an interesting situation isn't it? It just just fame, the way fame impacts um mistakes and um and learning. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Well, you, you become... sort of, yeah, you because you Let's let's talk about Mike Biddle for a moment because that never happens. Nobody ever talks about Mike. Finally, 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 the, finally the lights on me. So, Mike, can you tell Yo. me how did you really get started in this industry? How did I get started in this industry? Yeah, I where, where I are you went from? well. I went I went to a university, Rami, um, and I stayed there longer than you did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was no, I went to uni. I uh, I was. Uh, I worked. Uh, went. Went. Did a game design degree uh, in Wales uh, back when game design degrees were rare. Now it seems that every university uh, has one, for better or worse. Um, but yeah, it was. Uh, I did a course, studied for a few years, got out, got kind of a, a low level job at the kind of a company called Blitz Games, who did a lot of kind of shovelware. I guess is the impolite term, but. Yeah. <laughs> But it was good, um, and kind of worked there for three and a half years. Then moved to London, uh, and on just before I moved, I did a prototype uh, for Thomas was alone, like a flash game. I'd made loads of prototypes, and that was kind of the one that felt like it might be decent. Uh, so when I moved to London, and started working at a new company. Yeah, I was doing I was doing other stuff in my spare time and kind of fiddling with Thomas was alone, uh, which then obviously kind of came out and over the course of about six months became a thing that people bought and then I quit my day job and, and now I'm I'm doing the whole whatever the hell I want thing. Wow. That's that's, that's, that's the point it's history right there, right? So so how long is how long does this story take from you going to university to you doing Thomas Was Alone? The part where we like as where I start so knowing you, you, who Mike Biddle is? Uh, so when did we meet? We met at was it Game City? We met, right? It probably was Game City in Nottingham. I think it was in Nottingham. So that would have been that would have been about two years ago now, probably yeah. something like that. So I'd been working in gay. I'd I'd started uni eight years before that, wow. and then kind of I'd been working. I'd been working kind of in the games industry for yeah for about five years. At that wait, point. wait, wait. How old are you, Mike? Is that an impolite question? It's not. I'm twenty eight. Twenty eight. Wow, you're. People, so, I've got, a, I've got a childish face and uh, yeah. <laughs> way of approaching the world. People assume I'm younger than I am. Yeah, no, I'm 28. Well, yeah, I'm 25. People never, people never realize that I'm 25. I'm like an absolute youngster for a lot of people in this industry. I'm happy to say that by now there's like this new generation coming in of people that are way younger than me. So I'm starting to feel old a bit as well. But 
Yeah. Um, Twenty eight. So was 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 video game like education? Was that good education back then? Because you say you completed university, but I mean, I obviously didn't. I dropped out um, because I didn't like my school. But w- what was your course like? Um, it was okay. It was. Um, it's, I'm actually friends with one of my lecturers, but that won't affect what I say. I think it was. I think it was. It was okay. I mean, it was basically. Um, it was a very different time in the British games industry back then. Um, in kind of the same way Canada is now. Basically, Britain was a cheap way of American publishers getting their games made. So we. Um, before Canada kind of did its tax breaks and kind of took that mantle, we were basically cheap Americans. Uh, so what happened was we were all kind of trained with this mindset of, you know, go, you know we're going to teach you how to work at Blitz, Traveler's Tales, Rockstar, uh, if you're lucky, uh, Rocksteady that was just starting up, but no one had made kind of Batman yet, so it wasn't kind of a big a big yeah. known company. Um, Little Big Planet was just coming up, so Media Molecule was a thing. There were a lot of Sony studios in the UK back then. So it was basically, it was... a uh, a training course to be a grunt, uh, which is something that's really amusing and interesting to me now with uh, university degrees that they've all kind of shifted to kind of teaching people how to be indies or trying to do that because that's what kind of young people want to do now. It's which a is very interesting. interesting thing. Yeah, I've, I've it's an interesting seen, shift. Yeah, I've seen that same shift happen in the Netherlands. Actually, I've, I've sort of been part of that shift in the Netherlands. <clears throat> um, yeah. Because when, when Video Game University, when, when me and JW went there, Sort of the big companies you could work for in the Netherlands were uh, Guerrilla Games, who do Killzone, yeah. obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is sort of the Dutch national pride. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, Ronimo Games, which uh, created the Blob and um, and Sword and Soldiers. Sure. Um, and Awesome Knots recently. Um, and, and those were sort of the companies you could work at. There were a bunch of other studios that have so- since gone uh, bankrupt or out of business. Yeah, uh, or that had a restart, but um, it, you you were always taught to work for somebody else and and business yeah. or or entrepreneurship or even even like developing personal creativity was not really part of the course per se. Well, no, because I mean that's the thing is it was a it was a time where I don't, again this is very uk specific probably but basically a lot of university was becoming vocational and university was no the idea of university wasn't to go and become a genius in oh you know latin it was how can we get our students to graduate and get jobs yeah uh, and and that was very much the trust of the games degree because it was enough of a problem because a games degree you know if you're not going to if you've got a history degree uh, you don't have to work in history that's going to be respected yeah. Uh, but if you've got a video game design degree, you're not <laughs> going to get a job any, <laughs> yeah, on the back of true. that uh, anywhere other than games. So I think there was a real push to put people, and, and they are therefore reactive, right? So they kind of, they looked at the, the industry as was. And back then, I mean, Darwinia was just, either just happening or was about to happen. I think I oh, remember wow. playing that late in uni. So that was kind of the first of the the big modern indie games. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I would point to that as kind of the turning point of like, that was one of the first games on Steam. That was very, that was yeah, very... Yeah, that was huge. Yes, and especially for the British kind of game devs as well, because that was one of ours kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't really known. It wasn't a known quantity. The, the idea that you would make your own game. If you made your own games, it was to try and get a job. And that was my first, the first kind of, the first game I made was Reunion, which was unsurprisingly a pretentious platformer. Um, <laughs> and that, but that was not that, made because I wanted to release it because there was no way of releasing it. That was made to get me the job of Blitz. Yeah, yeah, that's that's an other actually random random question that popped in my, uh, popped up in my head. Do they actually teach Latin in England? Uh, yeah, the, yeah, you can learn Latin in England. I've got some mates who learn that. Um, yeah. it's, it's 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 like that's it's not something you'd learn in kind of a. Uh, a comprehensive but like if you go to private school or you um you can definitely study at degree level yeah uh, oh, latin funny. yeah it's it's a it's a it's a it's a thing but i've actually heard like a lot of um like writers say that latin actually helps because the structure is very different anyway it's a it's it's a, a, an interesting latin is a very shift. interesting like, i i I, yeah. I i was taught latin as part of uh, of high school um and greek actually classic greek um, oh wow! But, I, okay. but I'm I'm obviously like I love languages. I love 
I love the way language is built and how it evolved. Um, I, I, I was brought up with Dutch, English and Arabic, which are three, like, even though Dutch and English have like quite some similarities, um, their similarities just, if you, if you put them next to Arabic, like there's nothing similar about those languages. Uh, so I was always brought up with languages and switching between languages and seeing the similarities and differences between languages. So I've always been very fascinated by language. Yeah. So whenever I get the chance to ask what kind of languages people learn in a country, I, I always have to take that opportunity uh, because the, the Dutch were a traders country. So it's like you learn Dutch, English, German, French. Um, yeah. And, and then on the higher levels, Latin and cra classic Greek. Uh, and that's that's, like... that's what's really weird to um to English people because because we kind of live in this post empire kind of world. If you're English, you can basically go anywhere and just keep speaking your own language, and you know the locals rightly will be you know disappointed in you as a human being, but you get by. It's a really yeah. weird crutch that we all have. It's an absolutely massive privilege. Yeah, um, it's a, it, yeah, it's a it's an interesting advantage. Um... People know that I that I care about language um, and about the advantages of language in the industry. So I get a lot of messages in very broken English because even though like I want to help people that don't speak English, the only way they have to communicate with me is in English. Um, yeah. So I get these very broken English requests from people all over the world from. Um, Eastern Europe, from Southern Africa, from Southern America, from North Africa, but they can like commonly speak Arabic, um, mm -hmm. from all over the world, trying, trying to get in touch with the English press and like the English industry. Um, do you mean English speaking, or do you mean specifically English? No, English speaking. Uh, right. Press. Oh yeah. Um, and it's it's just it's very interesting to see just what a massive disadvantage it is to not have been taught English uh, in the video games industry. It's just oh, I'm sure, yeah. It's enormous. Like programming languages are in English. <laughs> sure. It's it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah. So where were we? You went to university, and university was kind of okay. For me, yeah. I think I kind of. I used it as basically three years where, like, quote unquote, didn't have to pay the bills. Obviously, I was accruing a massive amount of debt, yeah. but I kind of, it was kind of three years to find out what the fuck I wanted to do in my life. Um, so I think it was useful for that and, you know, kind of left to get on with it a bit. Um, so I guess in, in honesty, you know, would I have gained much less by spending, you know, three years living with my parents and not having a job? Maybe... It would have been similar. I think the big things for me are, you know, social stuff. Uh, it's where my where I met my girlfriend, who I've been with for ten years now. So yeah. kind of that was definitely worth it. Um, it's it was um, I kind of it opened my eyes a lot. I think the other thing, of course, was um, just realizing that there were influences outside of video games. That you know, it was fun to read books and visit museums and get into history and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, which I think university gives you. It points if you want to be pointed. It's it can point you in some very cool directions to kind of oh. learn how to learn and how to how to look outside your kind of comfort zone, which I think, especially as an independent developer, is really useful because there's enough games heavily inspired by aliens. You know, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, um, so I I wonder you you went to video game university, right? So you yeah, were, yeah. you your goal was to be in this industry sure. at that point. When yeah. when what made why is little Mike Biddle so <laughs> excited to be in video games? Have I told you the Shenmue story? No. Um. Well, okay. So I'll tell you the Shenmue story. So so I I have I told you my what, hope. <laughs> have I told you what my job was as a kid? No. I'm trying to remember if this has come up. So well, I was I mean, an, even though I, even if you have, there is ninety people listening right now. So we have oh we have to create the illusion. Um, yes, I, we've never I, spoken. I don't. If, if you have told me, I've forgotten, but I might have just been sleepy. <laughs> um, so I was an actor as a kid. Um, I was, and it was weird because it was something that I think my parents tried to get me into because I'm I'm kind of I don't like the word introverted because it's made up pop science, but like 
the the kind of I was a shy kid and I wasn't very popular in school, you know, like every other game developer, right? Um, so I was kind of nerdy, and I think my parents kind of pushed me into learning about um, uh, kind of doing drama school in the hope that I would get like into sharing and showing off, or at least learn how to fake it really well. Um, yeah. And I did, and obviously that's a skill I now use every day, the kind of, you know, being shy and quiet, but then also actually putting myself out there and kind of forcing myself to do it, uh, which, uh, which is useful. But, the, but so I was an actor, so I was, I was kind of going to be an actor, and my parents kind of kept me, like, kept telling me, you know, keep playing with the computer because, you know, if the drama thing doesn't work out, you need a backup plan. Um, <laughs> I, I, so, and, and I was, I remember the moments so I was playing Shenmue on the Dreamcast. Um, I had a chipped Dreamcast, so I just had like piles of CDs and, and I just played everything on the Dreamcast. I was part of the reason the Dreamcast died. Um, that's why I'm never too harsh on people for piracy because I was a horrific pirate as a kid. Um, <laughs> I was, so I was playing Shenmue um, and, uh, and doing one of those missions where you just had to wait somewhere for like two hours like two in-game hours, so like 10 yeah. minutes, like enough time that it hurts, you know? Um, and my agent called, and it was a play I'd been in in London was going to be touring Europe. Mm -hmm. And it was basically like, Mike, I need you to quit school, you know, a few months early and go and tour Europe with this play. And I was sat there, the pile of like revision work I was meant to be doing on the table, Shenmue in my hands, <laughs> and my agent on the phone saying like it was like proper crossroad kind of moment of like wow which which way is my life going to go and i just really liked chen mu and i was like i don't want to do that and i hung up i've never spoken to that agent since i think technically i never fired her so she might be owed 15 percent of everything i've ever made <laughs> um <laughs> there's like contractual obligations there i don't know um but she um yes yeah, so i i decided to you know keep working in school and, and learn what how the hell these things got made. Um, so I did. And that was it, really. And I just kind of, from that point on, when I was doing my kind of co my A-level, so that's what you do in the UK from the age of uh, 16 to 18, Yeah, there was no kind of focus on game design. So I kind of built my own, like, mishmash of courses. So I did, like, film studies, theatre studies, 3D design, psychology, photography, uh, something else I've forgotten because that was kind of as much as I could find that seemed relevant to designing computer games. Like yeah. I just kind of mashed together a bunch of courses that seemed like they might be relevant. Um, and then yeah, went and got the degree. That's that's actually very interesting how that worked out. So you you landed in video games because there was I mean the, the story is very obviously like a crossroad moment, but that's never what life is really like, right? Like decisions yeah. don't happen in a single moment that one um, did weirdly or at least that's how i remember right that yeah the story i kind of tell myself right you, you create these self mythologies so that's I actually be... also a very interesting point like self mythology is definitely like a thing because it's really hard to remember how things like i'm so i'm i'm actually um i'm actually gonna uh visit an apartment that i might move to uh, yeah. tomorrow oh, nice. morning really are you gonna be early. staying somewhere long enough to be able to have an apartment uh, not really, but I like the idea of when I go to the Netherlands of having a place that is a bit bigger than the storage box that I'm in right now. <laughs> sure, um, sure. Even though I don't spend a lot of time there. And it's also just because the Netherlands are sort of becoming more and more relevant in the games industry. There are more and more indies and other developers that visit the country. And yeah. I would really like to be able to offer them a guest room or just the keys to my apartment when I'm not there. Um so that's sort of a thing like when friends come to the netherlands I, I want them to be able to have a place to stay yeah um, yeah and this place just really isn't quite adequate for that <laughs> uh so it's 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 i want to move i want to be sure that when people come to the netherlands they have a they have like if my friends come to the netherlands they have a place to stay um so so i want i want to move um and it's it's sort of terrifying because i've had this place since before I started Vlambeer, yeah. uh, since the second year of university, the year I dropped out. And I just flat out cannot remember what my life was like at that point. Like, I just mm. genuinely do not remember what life was like before Vlambeer. Um, yeah. I knew I worked on a big project called um, uh, Lensflare, 
that was sort of a space sim because I was a huge space sim buff and I did that uh, mm -hmm. during the second year of university with a bunch of students and it's actually the reason I dropped out of university is because um, that project got shut down by my school because they needed the students to work on the projects that school had right got you. Uh, and I'm just like well listen I have I'm, I'm obviously showing ambition and I've got the team together and I'm talking to Microsoft and they're about to green light my project and you shut me down they're yeah. like yes we will shut you down universities can be weird like that I, I'm not going to name names but I heard a story a few uh about a few, uh, what little, I'm going to say a little while ago because it might be that people listening know what the hell I'm talking about. Where there was a, where there are universities trying to assert rights over kind of games that are being made by students, mm -hmm. um, and like, it's scary. I, I lent my lawyer to someone the other day just because it was like <laughs> you have to actually lawyer up on this because this is not cool. So mm -hmm. yeah, universities like there are definitely downsides. Like, but that's anything, right? That's any choice you make. I didn't realize you were at uni for two years though. That's I, I, I thought you dropped out earlier because like, you're my go-to example because I'm like one of the things I always say at events is, you know, be prepared to fuck it up and fail because yeah. that's, that's how it all works. And, one, and I just got sick and tired of people yelling your name at me and yeah. saying, well, Rami, Rami made Lambeer and they made Super Crate Box and, and it was amazing hit straight away. It's like, yeah, okay, so there's one example and it's Rami, so it doesn't count kind of thing. So, and it's um, also, and that's also and it's like bollocks, certainly right? untrue, of course. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I started making games when I was six and yeah, sure. and um, I started with like modifying gorillas.bas, which was this crazy game about gorillas throwing explosive bananas at each other. Mm -hmm. And then I made like terrible text adventures for like five years of my life I made failed RPGs like with way too large and like every idea I had was like <laughs> sure. way over scoped. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make a multiplayer RPG. I wanted to make a strategy game. I tried all of these like big, big ideas. I have this one idea that I still want to make. Um, I just, I just really, really wanted to make something really, really big. Um, that's everyone that, though, right? That's and everyone. That's, and that's the way people start, right? Like there there there's no shame in um starting dreaming big. Not um, at all. I, I mean like, the only problem the only problem and the fear I have now is that the people who are basically where we were when we were thirteen playing with that stuff and going like, Yeah, let's make the biggest game ever, some of them are on Kickstarter now. And that yeah. worries me because that's that's a very public way to fail. Yeah. Um that's a very public kind of you can ruin your reputation before you've had a chance to build it, and that scares Absolutely. me a bit. But I, no, I totally agree with you. I think being young, dumb, and like just going for crazy, like yeah, that's that's very important. And also embracing that throughout life. Like someone said to me the other day that like my one of my greatest skills, I think it was my girlfriend actually said to me, one of my greatest skills is like not knowing what I can't do. Yeah, <laughs> like like that. I just consist. I just run into every situation assuming I can do it. I think and, that is, a and certain... that gets me most of the way there, which I think is a useful skill. I think it's a skill you learn when you're an arrogant teenager, right? I think that's a. I think that's not a. That's that's actually that naivety. You kind of need that, um, yeah, because it stops you from making assumptions. I think. Right, I think that yeah. is that. I think that is absolutely the biggest thing is, <clears throat> like being not being afraid to ask people for things. Um, and not just assuming that you already like the naivety is like it works both ways because on one side it stops you from um, letting yourself be held but like it stops you from holding yourself back with knowledge you have right yeah no I agree yeah and it also stops you from assuming you have the answers to things <laughs> yeah. I think that's I think that's the biggest thing is when I do something exceptionally Beer, like I like I make so many dumb decisions I try so many stupid things um, but there's no harm in trying not at all no. is, is the biggest thing the the pro like you can try and see if something is possible and then make an informed decision because you'll actually have the knowledge of whether you sure. can do something sure. um, so I've I've talked to like so many Android micro consoles at this point and every time it's like, this is probably not going to work, but I might as well see if there's something useful there. 
Yeah, um, I, I want someone. I want someone to solve the micro console thing. Yeah. Just going off on a tangent, like I just, I really want a decent company to have a go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm still not quite feeling. Oh yeah. Um, no, no, I'm, not, I'm not quite feeling Ouya either. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a shame. I really, I really wanted Ouya to work. Yeah. Um, and I think in some ways it does because I do see certain developers. Um, certain developers earning money on Ouya, which is a good thing. Are they earning kind of like how are they earning compared to console and PC? Like, I mean, they're obviously not earning a lot of money. I think if you look at, at Super Crate Box, there's still not a lot of money being made. Um, I mean, Super Crate Box is free on the Ouya, but even that isn't getting all that many downloads. Like, because I would expect that I would expect Super Crate Box to be a pretty good. Yardstick just purely because you you know it's a, a known enough game. It's a good couch game. Um, actually, do you know what I love it on iPad? I play that on iPad. Yeah, it's it's. We really need to update the iOS version, but mm. I don't think people are making a lot of money. But that's like it's also a lot of people don't need to make a lot of money. A lot of people just need to make some money. But that's all of us, right? Like, yeah, I I I never. I'm not in this to become a millionaire. I'm in this. Because I want to keep making video games till I die. It's so, that so, simple. So here's an interesting thing. Like one, yeah. one of one of one of the fascinating things about game developers is the variety of backgrounds they come from. And sure. you say you used to be an actor. So I'm gonna guess that your oh, yeah. your interests in what you want to do with games are somewhat aligned with acting. Um, with storytelling? Storytelling, definitely. Um, but I guess yeah, I, I, but so also, I always Oh, but sorry. also, obviously, uh, like expression, and and like I have a I have a, a cousin of mine who does dancing, um, yeah, and he started his own dancing studio, which is he, he's super cool. Um, but one of the things he does is he uses no decor, he uses no set pieces, he just uses the movement. Yeah, and it's very fascinating to watch because he's essentially sort of deconstructing the art of of dance to its mm. sort of bare minimum um so what are you reconstructing or deconstructing like what are you remixing in your head to be your video games like what influences are there like oh god so well for me so the the core the the core of like with thomas was alone like so so i've worked on like I think Thomas Was Alone was my seventh released game, but it was the first one that I had creative control over. The rest were all kind of for other people. So I'll dismiss those because I didn't get to, mm. I just, you know, I showed up nine to five and I did my job, you know. Um, but the ones, so with Thomas Was Alone and Volume, it's about performance. And it's interesting that you say that because I'd never really made the link before with the acting, but it's totally true is for me, a game, game is theater. It's, it's, you, when I play a game, so I, I'm not yes, a player who gives a, I don't give I don't give a crap about my score. I never do. I don't care if I'm better than you at a game. I don't. I, this is why I don't really play multiplayer. I don't care. What mm -hmm. I care about is I want to pretend to be someone else for a bit. I love I love playing. You know, I, it's why I love the Assassin's Creed game because it's the best dress up set ever. Right? I get to be a pirate, <laughs> and I yeah. love that. And but for me, it's a mimetic thing. I'm. I want I want to, to be a pirate. I want to enjoy the awesomeness of being a pirate. I don't necessarily want to be good at being a pirate, but I want to feel like I'm good at being a pirate. You just want to run uh, up walls and I want to run up walls, up. do things, cool stuff, set pieces, but set pieces that are about me, not about kind of watching a cutscene. So from so that's kind of what I love in games and it's what I try and do. So with Thomas was alone, like I've still got the like the notebooks of like these are level designs for Thomas was alone. And it's none of it is, I want this one to be super challenging. It's, it's like this one. I want to feel the player. I want to make the player feel helpless. I want them to, it's, it's always driven by kind of what the emotional kind of response should be to a level. So I'm, yeah. I'm, you know, and, and yeah, for me, so influence wise, it's like, I go to a lot of theater theory because that's kind of, again, my background. So like I'm really into Brecht. Um, there's a little bit of Stanislavski, although I think he's overrated. Um, <laughs> but of course you would, but it's like, there's so, so I, I, I'm, yeah, actually my, I wrote a dissertation about how uh, Brechtian theater studies could be applied to the Metal Gear Solid franchise. Mm. Um, that was my dissertation at uni, um, <laughs> which is the most pretentious thing ever. Um, 
but yeah, no. So I'm 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 into that. I'm into architecture because architecture does a similar yeah. job. Archi- architecture is not about putting bricks down. It's about working out how people are going to move around the bricks. It's interesting it's, because I I always mention theater and architecture as big influences of of how I look at games as well. I wonder. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of people in the chat. I I wonder if if that's just us or whether that's sort of a common threat. Amongst games, because when you when you look at when you look at how video games are discussed in media, they're very often discussed as similar to to movies. Mm. Um, and I, I always just sort of have to disagree with that. They're not there. If anything, so so yeah. I mean, the movies thing is because it's a literal. Um, well, the first thing with movies is because it's on a screen, and the second thing with movies is that there's a cultural validity to movies. And that's what games have been struggling to do for like the last yeah. ten years or twenty years even is is basically a bunch of people turn forty and still play Mario and want that to be okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and look to like the outside world to validate that. And they look at movies and they go, "Well, Guardians of the Galaxy comes out and it's got a talking raccoon in it, and no one bats an eyelid about anyone going to see it. I want that for video games." Yeah. And I can understand that mindset, but I don't think it's useful. Um, no, the the best the best kind of comparison I ever heard was um, I'm going to name drop here for the first time in the conversation. So I was chatting with Warren Spector, yeah, um, <laughs> which you, you know Warren as well, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I I, I got him to introduce himself to Steve Gaynor as oh Steve as Gaynor. Steve Gaynor. Yes, he told yes, me. Yes, I was very um, happy about that. But he because he works he worked at Disney for a while on the Epic Mickey series. He he compares um, he compares animation to games, which I think is really interesting. Oh, that's because, interesting. Because animation is a very constructed medium, uh, it shares a lot with 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 movies, but it's also um, very expressive and very much tied to exaggeration and that kind of stuff. And obviously, as well, like however quote unquote photorealistic a game ever becomes, it's still a cartoon, yeah. and that's interesting. But yeah, no, I, I see games as theatre. I see them as role play. I mean, you know, it's interesting that you know the word role play is used so much. It's it is theatre, and it's just theatre where one of the actors paid sixty dollars. Yeah, um, I, I just really, I'm just really fascinated to hear that we have because I mean, we we talk a lot and we chat a lot, but very often yeah. it's it's related to like the business and the the. It's, it's like ninety percent Twitter drama is our conversation. Yeah, and, and yeah. The tw- the st- whatever is happening on Twitter at the moment. <laughs> Right, um, right. But like having this conversation about like influences and um, and other media is it, it, it's it's sort of striking to me how similar um, they are in in some ways um, because if you look at our games, they couldn't be more polar opposites. I think mm-hmm. uh, because our like Vlamber games are very very much steeped in um, skill and like being good at a game, at getting better, at being better than. Not necessarily better than others, but being better than yourself. They are, but I, I think that what you do, and this could very quickly turn into a bit of a, oh uh, yeah, this could turn really boring for everyone but us, if I just compliment you for a while, but it's, yeah. it is, with you though, you're still creating performance, it just so happens that you've decided that your player is performing as, you know, an ace fighter pilot, or as a... Uh, an amazing gun nut or as an as as a fantastically awesome mutant like you're you're just you're just letting the player role play those characters i decided to let players role play as slightly pretentious 15 year olds who happen to be rectangles um and in volume you're role playing as a do-gooder white knight kind of character who thinks he's going to save the world by being really nice on the internet and realizes that that's perhaps a flawed plan that's um, also very interesting. But that, well, yeah, right? Like, <laughs> torn from my Twitter hack account. <laughs> um, but it's it's like, yeah, so there's there's a... Um, I think you just chose different a different part. You know, the guy who writes and directs a movie about Bruce Willis jumping out of a helicopter is is just as much a writer-director as the, the woman who writes the incredibly thoughtful analysis via a film that's four hours long of uh, scientists in the 1800s. They're both using a medium and they're using a lot of the same stuff. Yeah. They're just telling different stories and providing different experiences. That's all we're doing. You're making action movies. I'm making action movies that are a bit pretentious. Yeah. 
I get, yeah, I mean, uh, don't, like if you look at Thomas Was Alone, it's hard to call it an, an action movie. Um, but it is though. But, but I, I can see what you're trying to say. So, so okay, so that's okay. You're about to get into one of my rants here because Thomas Was Alone is totally an action movie. Thomas Was Alone is Die Hard. It's Die Hard. Totally. In okay, terms so of... I, I usually go for Rambo for our stuff, but Die Hard, okay. So here we go. So this is why, right? Because okay. Die Hard is a, and it's, so I'm going to go off on one, but basically action movies, if you're making an action movie, you don't, you don't tell the story via a bunch of dialogue, right? You tell a story by the activities and the interactions of characters. Um, so when you're making Die Hard, if you want to convey that Bruce Willis starts off as someone who's a bit uncomfortable and out of his depth and ends up being an awesome superhero, you don't do that by having him have a speech at the beginning and the end. You have it by the first scene being him being told by a yuppie how to deal with um, jet lag. With jet lag. And, then, and then the last scene of him pushing a yuppie out of a window and making him fly. And that's like massive symbolism, but it's it's like that's how you do it. It's all through action and, and, and Thomas, getting him to take off his shirt at some point. And yeah, that's, that's important too. That's very but, important. But and Thomas was alone is the same. Like Thomas was alone. It does rely a little bit too much on narration, I think. But that's only because of the fidelity of the graphics. That I can't show you what a character's feeling. But then, but then you also, but you, but most of like your your idea of how those characters work is through their interactions. You. Claire's not Claire's a superhero because she can carry people across water. She's defined by her in-game traits. That's an action movie. Uh, it's a it's a it's a movie that tells its story through actions. Okay. Um, but okay. most games, most good games are, and that's and that's why I always get pissed off when people say um, Half Life uh, has a silent protagonist. When they when they say, oh, isn't it isn't it interesting that you can step into Gordon Freeman's shoes and he's silent so you can emote with him? And those people are sociopaths. Um, yeah. Because 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 you don't. When I'm playing Gordon Freeman, I'm playing Gordon Freeman, right? Yeah. He, he, he's he's a he's a scientist who feels a bit guilty, but really likes shooting stuff. You know, Gordon Freeman talks with his gun. That's I'm not Gordon Freeman. Uh, it's 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 it, people get conf people get hung up on the literal kind of reading of stuff, but you know, it's 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 an action movie. All video ga most video games are action movies. Most of the good ones, the bad ones, are the ones that you know stop the action every 20 minutes to give you a cutscene. Yeah. Those those are our equivalent of the kind of super preachy awful movie that you know tells doesn't well, show. So so do do like play devil's advocate for a moment. Please do. Please okay. Um so that's not that's not limited to action movies though. I I would actually say that that's almost critical to any type of movie is is the paradigm of show don't tell, right? Like Mm -hmm. Show people um, whether it's subtle or 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 very like uh, in the subtext, whether it's literal or it's, uh, metaphorical, like showing people actions or s certain things, like or sh certain views or things that evoke emotions or switching the color palette that you're using throughout scenes, which is very interesting. Uh, which I always like super love to look for in movies, like the color palettes of certain. Um, <laughs> fragments yeah. of a movie. If um, it's purple, someone's going to die. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so movies do that regardless of whether they're an action movie or not. Um, yeah. No, you're right. You are right. That's a very good point. Um, I, I, I have a hard time describing Thomas as an action game, even though there's obviously <laughs> action. Uh, and through action, a lot of, of because as you say, the level design is very, very guiding for the emotional state of the player in the game. Sure. Um, and and saying that it's just narration that makes you feel things in the game would be a giant disservice to Thomas Was Alone, I think. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not an action game per se, right? It's it's almost <laughs> you'd almost call it a a, a walk plus jump simulator. Nowadays, but um, <laughs> I mean, there's obviously a lot of stuff you need to do, and you need to switch between the characters and figure it out. It's it's a puzzle platformer. Um, mm -hmm. I one that I very very much enjoy, but um, it's not an action game. I uh, to be honest, like uh, yeah, I feel like 
I know. I totally agree. I, like you're, you've not said anything wrong. I was probably a, a cul-de-sac for me to start labeling things because we may be edging into what is indie territory here. I, I don't. Of, I honestly, the what is indie discussion is one of the conversation I care least about in this. But that's 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 my point, right? That's what I'm saying. Is we're kind of we might be we might be getting hung up on the terms and it's totally my fault for introducing the terms i think i think so i will back off is, immediately from that i'll back off from that but i think the interesting thing is the word action and why yeah. it created that because it's at the heart of video games per definition yeah. is, is action um, most video games yeah i, or, I would i'd say that the, even but i would say that there are examples of games that aren't aren't about action so for me you know dear esther is not an action is not there is no at least i mean i've played the first kind of three quarters of it the inter i might be wrong about later parts of it but it's, at some point it's, you get the guns and then you just <laughs> right yeah yeah but it's but it's a walking around game gone home is totally an action game because gone home you do move around the space you interact with objects your interaction with objects changes how the game plays out or at least decides the order that things happen, stuff like that. There's an interaction element. Whereas Dear Esther, to me, is an art gallery. And that's not a, a quality, um, a qualitative statement. I think it's a great art gallery, um, but it's it's not an action. It's not a series of actions so, so to me. Do you do, so we have this discussion within Flambeer about walking, <laughs> right? Yeah. This is, this is going to be fun. So we have this discussion <laughs> about walking, and in Flambeer yeah. games... So walking we define as um, not as an action but as pacing. Um, <laughs> that's a nice way of putting it. Yeah, and it's a very it's a very strange thing because that's very specific to Flamber games. I feel is that in Flamber games movement is so critical, um, and the sense of your movement is so critical, and yet we we see it more as pacing between the parts where you do other stuff. I um, think it de it depends on context, right? Like. So movement, for me, it's about the context of movement. So movement is kind of a blank canvas. It's yeah. a default. It's a default action, right? We're all, well, except for in Oculus games, <laughs> we all we all move around spaces, um, and that's how we mediate the world, right? That's how game, That's how the real world becomes three D. Is because we move in it. Um, but for, for me, it, it depends what the context of that movement is. So in Dear Esther, for example, if I stand still for five hours. Anywhere in that game, nothing happens. I just, it waits. And when I start moving again, it something happens. If, if I'm talking, though, about Super Crate Box, movement is vital and is movement is about fear and strategy and action because how you, where you are in the space is, is utterly crucial to that game. Volume is kind of a middle ground there because volume... Um, you know, it's contested space and you're moving around. So there are areas that are always safe. There are areas that are occasionally safe and there are areas that are never safe unless you change something and then you move through them. Yeah. So I think it's just about being conscious of that. I don't think movement is, movement can be action if it's um, against the backdrop of context, which gives it meaning. There I you mean, go. There's my pretentious way of saying it. Well, no, I 100% I agree. I mean, and I think one of the most powerful statements when it comes to movement uh, has been um, uh, a Vesper 5 uh, by Michael Bro, who just, <clears throat> this, just as far as I'm concerned, the, the one, just one of the designers that I look up to most in this industry. I totally uh, agree. Have, totally have you agree. played Vesper 5? I'm not sure I've played that one. I've played a lot of his stuff, but I'm not sure I've played that one. Is that the, so, actually, is that the tank one? The? Is that a ta is it tanks in Vesper? 5? No, that's that's a glitch tank. Oh, okay, um, no, no. no Vesper Five was this game where you play a, a monk, and you okay. get to make a move every single day. Oh, that's nice. You get to that's all you do in the game. You get to move once <laughs> every day, and then for the rest of that day, you can't move again. Um, hmm. And the game starts up and it fades in with your monk and then you get to make your one move. The monk sits down and the game just waits hmm. until you press escape. And then it fades out and shuts down. Hmm. And it was interesting because for many people um, it was sort of a strange game. Uh, because it didn't have a lot of action but I actually think it was one of the most impactful games in terms of of movement as action 
that I've yeah. ever seen. Um, just because it contextualized your movement in such a such a rigid way. Um, very very interesting game. If you haven't played it, it'll it'll take you a few months to go through. Mm. But uh, it doesn't take a lot of your time. Uh, another interesting thing the game does, by the way, is it plays back all your earlier moves before you get to make your move. So you start up and it runs through every move you've made from the start of the game to where you are. And yeah. then you get to make your next move. Interesting. It's very, very fascinating. Very interesting game. Okay. I need to check that out. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I've, I mean, I, I love him as a bloke. Like, I've not had massively long conversations with him, but I've chatted with him outside bars at game events, and he's one of those people who's who I'm terrified by because he's so much more intelligent than me. I have, um, I have that with a lot of people in this industry. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's, he's definitely in that category of people who I, I'm overwhelmed by because I just I know he's much, much better than me. Um, but also, um, yeah, no, what I've played of his stuff I've loved, but I need to fill in the gaps a bit because... Yeah, he's a genius. I, I, I hope he's not listening because he will, he will, he'll be hate very, this. very embarrassed by this conversation. He, he, and that, and that kind of, yeah, that says a lot about him as a bloke. Yeah, he's a wonderful guy. Um, have you been playing anything lately, by the way, Mike? Um, what have I been playing lately? Um, I, well, yeah, as I, I mentioned, pirates. I was, I did my usual thing of finishing the last Assassin's Creed game just before the new one comes out. Oh yeah, um, I I tend to do that. Um, so I did that. I played the pirate, the yeah, Assassin's Creed Four. Uh, Watch Dogs. It's been a bit of an Ubisoft month. I played Watch Dogs through. What did you think of Watch Dogs? Um, I I think it re it reminded me a lot of Assassin's Creed One uh, in lots of ways because yeah. it is it's it feels like the first game in a really cool franchise. It's, it's... um, but I'm looking forward to the sequel. Like the sequel's going to be more interesting. I think there's a few issues. I think the uh, from a gameplay point of view, um, the hacking actually, I think the hacking works a lot better than it could have, but it still feels a bit shallow in certain areas. Yeah. Um, I think actually the stealth game is solid. I actually, I think, I don't think it gets enough love actually. The kind of, when you're breaking into a building, playing, you know, jumping around the cameras, doing your thing, planning your approach, that's a solid little stealth game. It's, it, I think the wrappings of it, the, that's, the that's kind of, Especially from Mike Biddle, that's a big statement. I, it's solid. I don't. I don't think it's groundbreaking or changing the world, but I think it's a, a solid game. And then the, the 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 GTA kind of wrapper around that, I'm less fond of. But that's just more because I've played that game so many times before. I think. I think honestly, like with the game as is, I would rather have played a version of Watch Dogs that was eight hours long and just the stealth game, um, so, and maybe explore that a bit more. A very um, but interesting then, thing. The thing yeah. I liked most about the game was the was and this is very controversial I know was the driving actually. Uh, I loved the chases, um, and mm -hmm. I don't know why I did. All I all I can say is that it reminded me of a game called Split Second, which was oh like yeah no that you're right one yeah. racing game that came out. Like there was this there was this time in video games where there were just no party racers and even Burnout had done away with its split screen, and then suddenly two identical like two games with the exact same premise came out in like the same month or something split second and blur yeah. and the split second had such a nice visceral like i will i will i will outrace you and then i will also blow up your car yeah uh, that yeah. just made it really really fun very very mario kart uh in a way um, and I, I had that feeling with with watch dogs like racing around the corner and then just seeing the traffic light in the distance I didn't quite like that you had like this this like little giveaway of when you should press the button, but uh, just the feeling of racing and figuring out the best way to get rid of your the people chasing you was actually quite fun. Like I felt it, the game offered a lot of emergent fun situations. Um, yeah, I mean the problem I had with it actually was its lack of emergence. Like there were don't get me wrong, like it's I mean this is this is the the problem with this is why I don't really talk about Watch Dogs on Twitter because. It's very hard to not say, say an absolute statement. Like I, I think it works, but the one the, the, I didn't feel it was as emergent as I'd hoped, and that's that's probably a marketing issue rather than a game design issue to an extent. But I was 
I was I didn't find it had it, it felt like I had a magic button which which made one of the cars chasing me crash yeah. rather than a very deep hacking system yeah. and I I but that's exactly what I'm talking about when I say that for me those are first game in the franchise issues and I'm interested in what they build for the next one the other thing for me from a story point of view is my god the story I hated it was an um, awful story it was it a just, terrible story it felt like it felt like well it felt like what it probably was which is a lot of people getting involved i think yeah. what i i and i apparently i'm wrong about this but it felt to me like it had had a bit of a last minute panic and kind of been cleaned up you know how many games do that oh massively in the industry like the amount of triple a games that i've heard that have like last minute like polish ups of their but story I think, I, so i think the big one was i think like so spoilers for anyone listening to this like for not for not for like the ending or anything but like if you don't want to know the first hour of Watch Dogs or the first couple of hours of Watch Dogs take a break from this um, but like the whole thing about how in the past um, his niece died and his sister is now mourning the niece and he's trying to get rid of it it feels really weird as a motivation and I swear that game that was his kid and that was his wife because the whole damsel in distress crap they pull with that character again, it feels like that's the wife character. I, f I feel like they, I think they were making a game about a guy who was broken by the death of his kid, um, and that then was, you know, even more worried when it became uh, it became possible that his wife was now in peril. And I think they realised the very obvious issues and difficulties of do doing that, you know, respectfully and well. And yeah. went and 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 tried to diffuse it by making it kind of a a weird uncle relationship, which which for me didn't ring true. And 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 also, you know, lean on every you know every single uh, fridging idea ever. The kind of the, the damsel in distress, the I a honestly, woman dying so that man can be defined. Honestly, I do not remember anything of the story. I think Watch Dogs for for what it was had. It's very good moments, and then besides that, was completely forgettable. Yeah. Oh no. And that was that was the problem for me. I I overinvest in story in games. I'm massively guilty of this. Like every game I play, I really try and get into the fiction. Um, so which games do not disappoint you? Which games do not disappoint me? What, like what is now? So what is the Mike Biddle? top three recommendation of stories that would not be worth going Mike Biddle, would, that would totally be worth going Mike Biddle over. Would be totally worth going Mike Biddle over. Yeah, get over invested in the story. Read oh, all right, the books. I got you. I got you. So, I'm trying to think of Read all examples. the books, watch all the movies. So I still maintain that I think Assassin's Creed really holds up well. I mean, there's there's a lot of mess in the kind of the mythos about the, but I, I read everything. I've got books and books of Assassin's Creed stuff. I'm I'm very invested in that franchise. Mm -hmm. So much I hired one of their actors. Um, for you know, Danny. yeah, that's true, of course. And I get I I find out my spoiler every every few months from him. No, that's not true. Um, but he he's he's you know there's there's that lore I get really into. I think there's massive problems, obviously, in Assassin's Creed. Of but course. there's also but there's a lot of stuff I love there. Um, there's one criticism of Assassin's Creed that I never get, and it's the one where people say that the animus is so unrealistic. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, 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 what? Like how? Is yeah, that? that is. Yes, it's a video game about like here is your Deus Ex Machina, and mm. through that we're gonna tell like this is how we're gonna tell the story. And that's then how we'll, you, yeah. Then we we'll introduce you, another Deus Ex Machina, but but uh, it's it's internally consistent, or yeah. at least like I think it is. Like they don't. It was there was a moment in Assassin's Creed Four where I thought they dropped the ball, where they were kind of breaking their own rules about genetic memory, uh, but they very quickly fixed that via a short cut scene. And I'm like, you had you had broken that, and someone told you. Um, <laughs> but they go, uh, that was a last minute fix. But. So I, I do think, as far as AAA goes, um, I think Assassin's Creed does actually hold up as a story universe, and I enjoy mm -hmm. it for that. And I maintain the Watch Dogs at a very early stage has to have been the Desmond Miles game, and then they realize how much people hated Desmond Miles. Um, what else is great story-wise? What do I love? Um, I mean, Braid is beautiful, but that's kind of an over-played over kind of compliment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, what else? 
I'm just trying to think because I'm massively overly critical of everything. Yeah, um, no, that's exactly why I think this is this is an uh, interesting thing to know. I do love Mass Effect, but I'm told off constantly by my girlfriend for like, like my girlfriend loves Mass Effect. She actually, um, she played Mass Effect 3 before I did even. Yeah. Um, but, but she always points out to me like, oh, that's ripped off from that sci-fi movie. That's yeah, ripped yeah, off yeah, from yeah. that sci-fi novel. Like I'm not a massive um, reader, so I, oh, I, really? I'm, I'm not aware of a lot of its influences. So like I'm, I'm playing Mass Effect and I'm like, oh my God, a species that's just female. That's so clever. That's really interesting. And oh my God, what a cool idea. And she's like, yeah, that was, in blah 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 yeah blah, no, blah, I'm, blah, I'm, blah. A huge I'm a huge sci-fi i'm yeah movie. but so, to be honest so, I, so for me i love mass effect regardless of all of that i actually think they did a really good job of pulling together all these these like various influences um, yeah from both quality and like really like big bulb science fiction mm. uh, and i just very much appreciate that yeah, and I enjoy it, and I'm, I'm, I really hope that someone, a film studio, is desperately trying to find a way to rip off Guardians of the Galaxy and is looking at Mass Effect because Guardians of the Galaxy just proved to me how awesome a Mass Effect game, a Mass Effect movie could be, um, just I like in terms that of the. Movie. No, I loved it. No, I loved Guardians I, of the Galaxy. Yeah, I'm I, saying it's. I went two days ago. Yeah, I saw it on. I saw it the first screening I could find uh, when it came out. I was. I've been excited for that movie because I love the comics. I'm a big Guardians of the Galaxy so fan. So I'm I like, have, I've got to say this. I I love comics, but I hadn't read any of the Guardians of the Galaxy ones. Yeah. Um, should I? If I really really yeah. like the movie, like if you really 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 like, yeah. Well, if you like the movie, there's um for people who've not. If you're coming into it, I would recommend uh, there's the Bendis series that started written by um oh fuck what's his first name can't remember someone will say it in the chat um but that he, he they started basically kind of warm up people before the movie mm. so that's been going that's i think that's on issue like 17 or 18 now that's a solid that's like a good representation that's a comic book of the movie an ongoing front series of the movie which has the same kind of tone if you want to go back there's there's the 2008 guardians of the galaxies series which was which is very thematically, it's not as it's not as funny, and there's a lot of different characters who won't make a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and you know, Groot can talk. No, that's not in that one. That's an earlier one. Um, I mean, my, but like, yeah. My big thing is I I loved how the movie managed to walk that uh, balance of being both funny and a traditional action movie and having mm-hmm. its 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 traditional movie arc like it did so many things like in the most traditional way but because we haven't seen a movie like this since what since the 80s or something yeah it managed to just feel fresh yeah it's i mean they they have their cake and eat it too right like they they lean on every trope yeah because they they take the mick out of it it, it works no they're great so yeah. really i mean it's a beautiful script um, and it's and it's well directed, and the soundtrack is just very clever. Again, did you, like did you so cheesy, that? so cheeky that they would do the whole kind of eighties soundtrack thing. But, uh, sorry, seventies soundtrack. Yeah. That's nice that it's the music is from a, from the time when his mother was a teenager, which is just a lovely. Yeah. It's a love. It's a love letter from his mother, which is just a lovely way of doing the soundtrack. Did you sorry, see that? On. Did you see that Amazon is selling the CD of the awesome? Mix Volume One. Oh, absolutely, man! I've I've listened to nothing else for the last couple. Yeah, of Yeah, same thing. <laughs> I've just been having that on repeat. I was like, yeah, I've, this is good. This is good. I need this. Like, like seriously, can you imagine being the guy who was sitting on the right to um, uh, hooked on the feeling? <laughs> yeah. Like, how, how many? What is the royalty check for the guy who owns hooked on the feeling going to be yeah. like next month? Like, wow. ser- like. The number of people who must have logged into Spotify and just like Hooga Chaka, Hooga Hooga Hooga, <laughs> like, like that that dude or girl, and it's probably like it's probably someone's kid now. It's probably not the original like yeah. person who owned the rights. It's just like yeah, man, the check is going to come through the post for that person next month. Jeez. Yep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you, no. I, did you I thought go was, to any other movies recently? I went to uh, the Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Did you see I'm that? going to. I'm hoping to see that tomorrow. Um, I actually yeah. need to call my mate, and because I'm meant to go and see it with someone, and I decided I would see it tomorrow, and then never told him. 
Oh, um, so I need problem. to give. So I will jump on Twitter and DM him later. But or he might be watching this. Roper, if you're watching this, I want to go see the movie tomorrow. Um, <laughs> I want to see because I love the first one. Or the you know the first of the re you know the, the last one, right? Um, yeah. The, the like, one before this one. What's the what is it? What's it like without spoilers? Like is it is it is it as good as the last one? I so I I have I liked it. Mm. I have my I have my thoughts about it. Um, but I don't want to prime you on the movie in any way, so I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay, I, we'll, we'll chat about it after. Yeah, we'll chat about it some other time. Um, any other movies that I that I missed? I, I so I was in the UK yesterday or two days ago. No way. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I was in. I was in I was France, in, so I'm not. Feel, I don't feel angry that you didn't call me. But no, I knew you were in France. Um, oh, right, cool. But. Um, so I, I could see a lot of movies that just aren't available in the Netherlands yet. So I went to Dawn and uh, Guardians. Um, mm. Have you seen um, Have you seen uh, Snowpiercer? I've not yet. Is that out in the UK? I, I'm not sure. It's it's. I've heard really. Of... I've heard people like I read Lee Alexander's thing on it. It sounded it sounded cool, but kind of not the greatest movie ever, but kind of entertaining. Is it the one though that's been cut? Because there were two, there's two versions, isn't there? There's the one that um, the studio made, the studio cut and made their own version, and there's the version which is the original. Which one's in the cinema? I, I always, or has that I'm been not, changed now? I'm not sure if that's true. I know that Snowpiercer had some trouble with their, uh, with the uh, the American part of the team. Uh, well, it's Miramax, it's, isn't it? So it's Harvey Weinstein. I think. It's, yeah, 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 it yeah. is. Uh, yeah. But it's I, it's a South Korean movie. Um, Based on a on a comic book as well, um, okay. on a graphic novel, um, but there were some troubles with the uh, with the release, and it ended up being in the for some reason it ended up being in the sort of art uh, side of of the uh, of the box office. Okay, and that just it it's it's awful because this movie like if it had been a full theatrical release. Sorry, just one second, mate. I just need sure. to. My girlfriend, I don't know what she's saying. She's m miming to me, but just give me one second. Sure. I'm just going to drink another sip of Coke. Um... This is fun. I should probably do this more often. Hello, I'm back. Hello. Hello. Yes. What were we talking about? Snowpiercer. Yeah, Snowpiercer. Um, no. So if that movie had had a full theatrical release instead of just art house, I think it would have been huge. Mm. Um, because it's another one of those movies that um, honestly should have had. Like it's it's just it's a throwback. It's very very pure. It just dares to be what it wants to be, um, and I appreciate that. Like I don't see a lot of movies do that nowadays. Like it, it, movies suffer from a lot of the same problems as, as games, um, especially the big ones like um, <clears throat> the the uh, lowest common denominator problem. Um, and and Snowpiercer very much felt like a movie where somebody just went like, no, th no, no, I don't care. This is the movie. This is what I'm gonna make. And that's what they made. Um, yeah, very similar to the to uh, the raid before. You see, I've still not seen the raid. I, I it's it's I saw Dread, which is apparently very similar. Um, Dread was pretty, and, yeah, and then kind of didn't get around to seeing the raid, and and now like the sequels out, right? I need to catch up because all my mates, all my mates love that film. Yeah, I need to uh, I've been told off for not seeing it many times, so I will. Uh, I'll be checking it out. Okay. So how about we do this? We have like let's let's wrap this up in like ten minutes. Cool. Um, let's see if there are people in the chat that want to throw some questions our way. Like rapid fire. Yeah, kind of... rapid fire questions. Yeah, no, no worries. Sounds uh, good. Let me tweet about that as well. I've got I've got bloody hooks on a feeling stuck in my head now. <laughs> Can you I... sing that while I say, while I send this tweet? <laughs> Hooga check, hooga, hooga, hooga check. I can't stop. What is it? Help this feeling, yeah. 
<laughs> I, deep inside of me. I'm probably breaking. I would be breaking copyright if I was singing it well. <laughs> That's the best excuse. I'm just singing this. I'm just. I'm not... intentionally doing it badly so as to avoid legal issues. Yep. That's the only bit that anyone cares about. That's like every, if you just sing that over and over again, it is a hundred percent fine. It is a single with the single best piece of cover art you've ever seen, though. <laughs> like se seriously, look up the cover art for uh, for Hooked on a Feeling. It is it's it's a solid a solid work of art. I wonder. I wonder. I'm going to do an image search. I wonder if yeah, Hooked on a Feeling now brings up the Guardians of the Galaxy logo as its first result. That of is course. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, it's a bunch of guys sit, stood with snowballs in the Arctic. It's great. Anyway, carry on. Okay, so favorite food? For me, macaroni yeah. and cheese. Macaroni and cheese. I'm a connoisseur of macaroni and cheese. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm, I'm Dutch pancakes. Okay. So they're, they're not quite American pancakes, and they're not quite crepes. They're somewhere in the middle. Um, yes, I know exactly what you mean. I know exactly they're what you mean. awesome. We eat them with, like, uh, maple syrup or syrup. Or like cheese or like stuff like that. They're they're the best thing. Yeah. Um, why has X has done Y before? Such a horrible thing to have said about your game. Oh, as in like people saying it's it's copied it or something. Yeah. Um, I don't think it is such. I think it's a fine thing to say. I don't mind people. I think it's, I think it's a useful shorthand um, yeah. for lazy people. Well, not lazy people, but people who can't be asked, like explaining their innermost thoughts about something for 20 minutes like yeah. arrogant people like us like they're they're yeah I, I think it's i think it's an absolutely fine criticism i think uh i, I think there's a there is a preoccupation with video in video games of kind of being new and innovative and i think actually being competent is a much a much rarer and bigger yeah, I, um, I, I agree skill than is than is often respected one one of my favorite stories about this is still uh tale of tales who did amazing work with the the graveyard and the path and a bunch of other things mm -hmm. um and and they talked to me once they just wrapped up their uh, their kickstarter uh for sunset um and they talked to me about how when they started they wanted to be as radical as possible uh, and they managed to do that they managed to really like shift paradigms in gaming multiple times over uh, and then at some point they realized that one of the reasons that people couldn't engage with their work as much was just because they wanted to be too radical they wanted yeah. to change too much and yeah. instead of making things um interesting or moving ahead or or moving forward gaming as a medium um they just didn't really do anything at all because 12 people played the game yeah um, so there's definitely like when I when I discuss Nuclear Throne, I often say it's a lot like Hotline Miami meets Binding of Isaac, which is absolutely untrue, but also gives you sort of the um, the emotional like feeling that you're it's a framework, to have. right? It's a framework. It's, yeah. it's like it's a skeleton to hang actual feedback and thought on. So yeah. no, I, I do the same thing. Like I mean, with volume, you know, it's obviously got kind of. It looks like Melgus Side VR missions. You know, like it, there's. I people, love that game. I love that game, but it's it's something that you know everyone. I'm all. I always get. I get probably about three or four times a day. Someone will send me a message going, oh, "Why are you playing Metal Gear VR missions?" And it's like, you know what? Like, you know what? Given the information that person has, fair enough. You know, that is what it looks like. I get it. I'm hoping though that people kind of understand why those choices have been made and 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 pick things up from it and take meaning from it when they play it. But we'll see. So I, I don't see it as a problem. I think it's an absolutely human first step in understanding something. So so for at Vlambeer we have this thing where we um, we sort of prohibited ourselves to say um, when we when we take inspiration from another game we we prohibit ourselves from saying the name of the game. It's a very strange right. thing. Uh, it, it happened because we were making this RPG once. We never released that. It was terrible. Uh, we were making this RPG and we needed an inventory system. And we kind of said, like, we need an inventory system like in Diablo 2. And right. uh, we, we implemented that. And then we realized that all of a sudden we had, like, scrolls of identify <coughs> equivalent items and, like, all of this stuff that just came along with it because we were taking stuff from Diablo 2. And we're just like, this is not what we meant. What we meant was an inventory system with a grid yeah. with items that have a certain shape on the grid and then through reorganizing you can make space 
So this totally happens. Yeah, I know we're, we're spending too much time on one question, but this totally happens. Like, you, am I right in assuming you've worked? You've never worked in like a big studio environment, right? No, nope, no, I didn't. So this is like this is the bane of working in big studio environments because if you've got like ten designers working on a game, and one of them says, "Oh, we should do the inventory system. We should do we should do an inventory system like Diablo 2, All nine other designers think they mean something different. Yeah. And it just creates this horrible mess. So yeah, no, absolutely. It's a, it's you know, it's hard enough with you know one indie, especially, and then the press, and then you have like you know people playing games, yeah. putting their own assumptions on. So yeah, no, I, I try not to do it, but I think with volume, it kind of invites that comparison. And I don't mind the comparison. I'm a massive Metal Gear fan, so I can take it. Next how far, question: How far have you gotten into Nuclear Throne? Oh, like nowhere, like nowhere. I've, 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 I think I've only. Yet, I don't think I have bought it yet. I think I've only ever played because I don't buy early access games. I, I, I just like as a point of not of principle, but just like I want to play. Like I want to play the best version of Nuclear Throne that exists ever. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to wait until you've you've finished. Um, That's actually a very very funny thing. I was asking on Twitter two days ago, like how many people have want to buy Nuclear Throne but haven't yet. And oh, the I'm there. Was I'm there. Overwhelming. Uh, so saying the same thing or saying that they've already bought it? No, just people that said, like, I'm waiting until... And then various things. Like, some people are waiting for the console or handheld release for PlayStation 4 or Vita. Mm -hmm. uh, some people said that we're going to wait until it's done, <coughs> until it's finished, and until it's out of early access. Some people were saying they don't have the money, they're waiting for a sale. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was just very surprised to look in Steam and see that Nuclear Throne has had more... Currently has more people that have the game in their wish list than people that have bought it, which is very, I've heard very that, overwhelming. I've, I've heard that from a lot of people in early access. I think there's a lot of people like me who kind of, well, in my case, it's like, because I know you guys, and I'm like, I'll play this the second Rami says it's done, or that Rami says it's like there. Um, I respect you enough as a designer. I want to play that version of the game. I don't want to waste my time with the version that's not done. Um, I'm the same with a lot of, there's a lot of early access games I really want to play, but I just, I want to, I want to play the final version. Yeah. I can see that. You I never mean, get I that second chance, right? that, but... but that said, I have played it because I played it at events, and I like if I see it. At, you at were event, terrible, I think. I'm really bad at it you, because yeah. I'm not playing it. Yeah, yeah, no, but I, I, but I played it without you watching. I'm better when you're not watching. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> when you're not in the room, I'm much better at the game. Um, but it's one that if I see it at an event, I've got like ten minutes. I'll just go over and like see how it's going. But it's I know that if I if I bought it, I'd want to play it for a period of time and. And I, I don't want to spoil it for myself. I want to play the final version, man. How, how do you feel about creativity in games? That that's an interesting question. What, like, what 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 does what do they mean with creativity? Creativity what, what, in games. Um, I don't really understand the question. Neither there should be yeah, like yeah, there should Maybe be creativity. A creative answer. Um, I think you should make games creatively. I think if you're making games uncreatively, then Go be. There's much better paying jobs. Yeah. Like if you if you don't want if you, if you're not doing this because you love making video games, go be an accountant. Go be a. They, 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 there are better jobs which require the same level of technical skill as making a video game, and they're much better paid and they're much more stable, and you'll have a nicer house than me. Um, <laughs> so just go do those jobs. But yeah, yeah, I think I think creativity is is crucial. But I also think that creativity and a lot of words, a lot of buzzwords, um, can be used to attack people who make games that you don't like. And I think that's lazy. I don't like that. So I, don't, I think saying this yes. game is uncreative is fine if you're using it subjectively. But if you're making a blanket statement that. Triple A games are no longer creative, which I've heard lots of people yeah, say. And it's like, dude, you, you're you're wrong. They're great. Yeah. Like, play some. They're really fun. I mean, um, I was playing. I was playing the new Wolfenstein game recently. I thought that was pretty creative. I mean, it's a very traditional shooter, but the commander thing, the commandant thing, was very very well done. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the first games that truly let me switch between stealth and action, or forced me to switch between stealth and action. You know, mm -hmm. if, if I if I get seen in your average stealth game, I just kill whoever saw me and then hide in a closet for like ten seconds. That's why I don't know you kill people in volume it changes the whole thing. Yeah, and and Wolfenstein did that perfectly. Wolfenstein, uh, yeah, I, I really I really dig Wolfenstein. I mean, if you get seen, like it was interesting because it had a very dynamic way of dealing with situations. In that, if you managed to sneak your way up to the commander, you could just sort of like 
kill the remaining guards and be done with it and you only yeah. have to kill like six enemies um, did you play did you play the um because it's it's similar in that respect to the um i can't remember what it was called the uh was it something mercenaries the um the it was it Killzone Mercenaries, the Vita, Killzone? Yeah, a, bunch of, a bunch of games have done that, but I think yeah. the other really managed to like sort of nail it in its best possible way with, yeah, the, with the distance that's indicators fair. and everything. Yeah. Um, like, it, it, like everything about the mechanics felt good. And I'm just like, this is absolutely something that an indie game could have done, but we didn't. Like, indie games didn't do that. This is a AAA thing. Um, and I mean, like, I, I think that we need both sides. We need AAA to push things and innovate on like large scale things that can inspire indie developers and indie developers <laughs> create small things that can inspire big developers i think that's a back and forth oh totally i think and if you actually like get some triple a developers and some indies in a pub chatting to each other they're all the same there's the same people right it's the same attitudes the same the same we... desire to create cool stuff and okay, okay. just different desks they 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 uh self-titled uh specified the question more uh he meant or she meant Kind of meant games where you build things. Oh, I see. Kind of, I'm, I yeah. Well, I'm making one. That's um, does Nuclear Throne have a level editor? Do you? No, allow that? it's procedurally generated. I know. Well, I know it's procedurally, but you don't you don't allow people to do that as well, right? We it's... allow people to seed. Okay. Not yet. We're working on that. <laughs> cool. There you go. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing this. I I'm I think it's really interesting. I think there's a there's a lot of myths about player generated content. The reality of player generated content is most of it's shit. Like, because most of what anyone makes is crap. Yeah. Um, yeah, most of the internet's shit. Most of television is shit. Most of everything, most video games are shit. Most of this right? conversation is probably awful. Most of this conversation is absolutely appalling. Um, so, so you, it's for me, the, the interesting thing for as a designer for creating volumes, level editor, and stuff has been trying to create tools that encourage good good design and encourage and facilitate making the right choices in terms of um, not not trying to prescribe a way that levels should be made but but kind of trying to nudge people the example i always use Sounds is like a rough challenge there oh it's really tough and i'm going to fail because everyone in history always has but the act of trying gets us closer than yeah, not trying true. so so i always use the lego analogy is that lego if you make something out of lego it's there's going to be a lot of aesthetic quality to what you make that you didn't. You're not responsible for. There's a symmetry and and scale consistency that's because you're working with bricks. Um, you're limited to well, I don't know what the current number is, but maybe like 15 colors, uh, and those colors have all been chosen to work with each other. So that's always going to look reasonably decent. You know, bricks only fit together in a certain number of ways, which means that you are encouraged to build. So, so you can, if you build the tools correctly, and if you build the way things are placed correctly, you can encourage good choices. You're still yeah. going to get loads of shit design. Um, you know, a lot of my levels are probably going to be shit. Um, <laughs> but you, uh, yeah, it's about it's about kind of so, encouraging cool stuff. Because you can sort of go two ways. Like what I'm hearing from you is you're trying to make sure that as much of it is good. Um, and what I very often hear is people don't care about what is what is bad. They just want people to be able to find the good stuff. I mean, I'm, yeah. I, you're obviously going to try and surface good content as well in volume. Uh, yeah, that's like that's the bigger challenge, actually. That's that's a really tricky one. Um, that's interesting to hear. Yeah, well, we're working on it. It's. I think what we're probably going to go with is something very simple. Um, just a simple kind of, you know, rating system, good stuff rises, bad stuff falls, and and see how that goes. I think it's probably the thing that we're most likely to need to fiddle with post-release. Yeah. Because I'm sure we'll overlook stuff. Um, you know, and, you know, things, just running servers in general, there's lots of, of yeah, areas that can go wrong. That's, the, that's an area that I'm bringing in other people to help me with because, yeah, it's okay. messy. Here um, we go, but, Ra rapid fire. We're going to have two and a half minutes left. Uh, when you feel you have a truly different idea, something that definitely no one has done before, are you cautious about communicating it? No, because ideas are really easy. It's yeah. the it's the years of making it actually good that is effort. Ideas cost nothing. Yeah, I agreed. I mean, all of our games have been cloned at some point in history, and I I mean, obviously it was very demotivating at some point, but I still feel better about having communicated about the yeah. project than 
having kept it a secret. If if our oh, ideas oh, get only cold, caveat, only caveat is if something is incredibly quick to reproduce. Uh, so something like the three situation that I would possibly, I honestly probably wouldn't attempt to make a game like that now. Yeah. Um, just because of the risk of that. I want to make something that if someone does decide to clone, it takes them a couple of weeks, not two hours, um, just purely because I you know, I think lazy people are lazy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if time and money were no object, uh, no, no object, what game would you most like to make? Um, I, the one that I'm going to do at some point when I have enough money is I really want to do a, a musical. Um, oh. I, that's something I'm dying to become a massive fan of musical theatre, but it's very expensive because effectively you're making a game and a two hour music album. Yeah. Um, so that's going to be, that's one, that's my once I've got lots of money um, game, yeah. basically. Uh, Vol Thomas was alone made enough money to make two volumes. Once something makes enough money to make two musical games, I will try and make one and see if it that fails. That sounds like a very sane approach. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I honestly, like, I, I wouldn't know. Like, time and money are, like, not... I, I do need constraints in some way, otherwise I just get paralyzed. So I'm, I'm pretty sure. happy that that's not the situation I'm in. Um, let's see. Uh, blah, 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 blah. How, when do you decide to bring in more people versus doing it yourself? Um, Make it one what, sentence. When something's too challenging. So I'm doing it right now because I've got a lot of boring code jobs on volume that I can't be asked to do and I've got much more important things I need to focus on. So It's a very I'll strange bring in thing where your time becomes very, very valuable when you... Massively so, especially for me because I'm not, I, you know, I'm very jealous and envious of your partnership because you have two people uh, who can pick up each other's slack. I don't have that. So every Sometimes second I... Yeah. Every second I spend uh, promoting myself is a second I'm not coding, uh, and vice versa. So I'm always making those kind of trades. Uh, so yeah, it's very hard. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try like I'm, I've I've just because the response has been really good. I might do this again with with other people, uh, do or it. I might ask you again. So I'm just gonna ask you, who do you think I should call next time? Who should you call next time? Yeah. Um, I think I mean I'm always a fan of hearing Zoe Quinn talk. I think she's awesome. I think she'd be a very good person to talk to for a, for a couple of hours. Good. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Mike, for uh, letting me randomly call you at this hour. That was um, a lot of fun. I'm uh, I, I'm gonna let you get back to watching a movie with. The... I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go watch. I'm gonna. I might go and try and talk my girlfriend into watching Noah with me. I just bought oh. the Blu-ray. I'm yeah. intrigued by it because I love Christian mythology. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. I'm looking forward awesome. to that. Oh man, this this. If we keep talking, this conversation is gonna go for hours. Anyway, <laughs> if you don't have Mike Bithel on Twitter, he is at Mike Bithel on Twitter. He talks a lot on Twitter. It's true. It's uh, true. But if you are used to my Twitter, it's not that bad. Um. So follow Mike on Mike Bithel. I'm Rami. You, you probably follow me on Twitter. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. I think. Uh, I'm probably gonna go do this again in the future. I'll let you know on Twitter. Thanks, Mike. You're very welcome, man. I think you should do it again. It's a, it's a cool idea. Good. Talk to you sometime soon, man. All right, man. Speak soon. Bye. So, that was the first the first try of Rami Ismail randomly calls somebody. Um... I'm gonna sign off now because I really, really promised that I would play Gears of War with Miss Minotaur here. So I'm gonna go and play uh, Gears of War before I go on a big food tour of the Netherlands tomorrow. Uh, gonna get all the Dutch treats before uh, before she has to leave the country again. Um, I will be back at some point in the future. For now, the next few weeks are kind of gonna be crazy. I'm gonna be headed off to Vancouver. Um, for full Indie Summit, and then from Vancouver straight into GDC, and then from GDC um, onwards to... Uh, where am I going? I forgot. I'm going somewhere. I'm going somewhere after GDC, but I'm not sure yet. I'm pretty sure I'll be flying. PAX is definitely happening. Um, so that was kind of it. For, uh, for this time, I'm going to leave you with some music because I do feel that leaving people with some music is a good idea. And since I didn't prepare this at all, it's just going to be a piece of Yukio's beautiful, beautiful nuclear throne music. 
Uh, thank you so much for listening and talk to you some other time.